Uh, my name is Kelly Jones. I'm with the National Verify team. Um, if you could please introduce yourself, uh, pronounce and spell your name and uh, your title and what you would like us to call you. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, Kelly. My name is uh, Sui Lu, uh, spelled as S-I-W-E-I-L-Y-U. Uh, I'm currently an Empire Innovation Professor at University at Buffalo uh, State University of New York. I'm with the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. So can you please tell me a little bit about your background in deepfake technologies and also what is a deepfake? Okay, so um, as a computer scientist, my research interests cover uh, in this area known as multimedia forensics. So generally speaking, we're interested in exposing and mitigating the negative impacts of all kinds of fabricated and manipulated digital media, including images, audio, and uh, videos. Um, so my my experience into the, I, I've been working in this area for more than twenty years since I started my grad study um, um, in 20, 2001. Um, and I ran into deepfakes uh, in twenty seventeen uh, in a conference I uh, I participated. Uh, and uh, the other part of my research interest, by the way, is artificial intelligence, including machine learning and computer vision. So one of my colleagues actually pointed out to me this new story about uh, this new type of uh, fake media uh, or uh, fabricated media, and, and they called it at the time deepfakes, uh, which immediately grabbed my attention because it's combining. So these deepfakes are the kind of uh, synthetic media that were made not by human using uh, editing media editing tools but actually run by algorithms that were you know trained on large amount of media and then create those kind of fabricated media automatically um and and i was very interested in this topic because uh you know this is e exactly in the intersection of my research interest on one side i'm interested in exposing fake media on the other side um all this uh, media were actually created by AI algorithms. You know, at one side, I'm kind of um, um, uh, interested and um, I'm glad to see that the AI technology have has been the ones to such a level that we can create very realistic multimedia um, that to the extent that, you know, it's very hard for humans to differentiate them from the real ones. On the other hand, it also makes me concerned because I work in this area I already know, you know, just like simple Photoshop um, can cause a lot of problems. And if we are having this kind of algorithms, just scale up the uh, production of fabricated media, democratize this tools, this kind of tools, then, you know, a lot more people can use them to create fake media and then potentially that will increase the negative impacts. Um, of, of false media. So, so that's that's why I got interested in this. And I have a student working with me at the time. We started working on uh, a detection algorithm and we actually detect one of the first, we actually developed one of the first detection algorithm for uh, uh, deep fake videos. Uh, it was a very simple cue that we realized faces in those fake videos do not have very good eye blinking motions. Um, and, and we actually figured out that is because they, their training data has that kind of bias and the generation algorithm actually inherited that. Subsequently, you know, this topic got a lot of attention and uh, my group has been completely devoted to this topic. Uh, we developed a series of detection algorithms, not, you know, starting from that simple cue all the way to uh, more sophisticated data-driven uh, neural network-based uh, detection algorithms. We also provide um, an open platform called the fake o meter where we actually bundle uh, a lot of bunch of uh, several uh, state of the art open source deep fake detection algorithms into one web web portal so that users can go there if you know uh, the user has an interest of testify uh, um, verify the authenticity of one piece of media uh, she could actually just go to that website and try it on different state of art algorithms. Um, so bypass all those, you know, download the code, compiling them and then running them, that kind of uh, um, uh, trouble. Uh, I was also, um, uh, um, 
expert but uh, testif uh, testified at the Congress uh, in September 2019. Uh, for my for my uh, experience in deep deep fakes at the time, the Congress, the House, Rep the, the House of Representatives are very, very interested into this topic and they were concerned about the potential negative effects. So I was invited to give um, a testimony there and uh, talk about my understanding of the problem and uh, potential mitigation measures. Um, and subsequently, I was also invited to New York State Assembly uh, for a similar uh, testimony. Um, and I was serving um, advisor, as advisor for the defect detection challenge uh, happened last year, uh, sponsored by Facebook. So I, I have, I, I did gain a lot of experience along the years of understanding the problem and seeing the technical, you know, um, have a have a broader understanding of the technical solutions, and also being able to see like the 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 more non technical side of uh, of this problem. So I I think I I can I can safely say I have a kind of comprehensive view of this problem. Um, yeah. Um, is deepfake technology so advanced that it could trick an iPhone or some, you know facial technology, you know facial recognition softwares? Like, could you unlock an iPhone with a deepfake? Okay, um, I I don't really think so. Uh, it's not there yet. Um, what, one of the critical factor is all the current deepfake. Uh, algorithms, AI-driven deepfake algorithms, they're creating for the visual media, they create 2D visual media. So it's like an image, like it's, it's probably easy to create real and make you feel like you were talking to a real person, uh, but that was actually generated by algorithm. But what the algorithm cannot do is create a 3D presence. And that is what is used for unlock iPhone. So the iPhone, Unlocking algorithm using three bell metrics. They send out this um, uh, um, uh, um, unvis invisible um, um, uh, a signal out, and they actually use the three dimensional. Like my head uh, has a particular three dimensional shape, and 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 that that was used as a signature for my identity to unlock iPhone. And that three dimensional information is what the fake algorithm currently cannot recreate. Um, so that's uh, so that is one of the um, I think for now the situation is like that. But I could not I would not say you know in the future this will not happen because if we combine with three D printing technology, um, and if we can actually recreate someone's face, um, you know uh, some have all the geometry of someone's face captured by the algorithm. Then you know, I think you know down the road in the future somebody must you know um, will start to think of along these lines where they will use that recreate uh, uh, synthesis algorithm to create the three D scans of faces. We already have algorithm that can create three D scenes and three D objects completely from neural network. So combine that with three D printer and print something that is flexible. So, you know, not like a rigid objects, but something with flexibility like human skins. Um, and then it is possible to, you know, create that 3D presence. And, and that's when we should really take this problem, this question seriously. I will just give you one example, not related with deep fakes, but, you know, somehow along the design. And, and that's the reason I have, I, I, I thought about this. Um, uh, there were a few years ago, there was a case uh, it's a federal legal case. Um, a drug dealer um, who has who who was who, who deceased was deceased, um, but he has all his data on on an iPhone. And back then, the iPhone was unlocked by fingerprints. And the iPhone fingerprint algorithm actually uses three dimensional fingerprints. So you need a thumb, and you need a live thumb, which means it has blood, has temperature, has you know all the liveness signs. And the, and the scientist uh, from Michigan State University actually recreate a 3D thumb using silicone, um, I think it's a kind of silicone material and give it a temperature, give it a blood flow. And they actually recreate, by recreating that 3D thumb model of the drug dealer, they were able to unlock the iPhone. So I think, you know, that's the kind of uh, analogy you put this together with deep fakes, then it is, certainly possible down the road with the kind of technology development we have these days uh, that sometime in the future 
uh, this problem, this this question will not be like a a, a certain no uh, as we're doing today. So I I just want to put a word of warning on that you know for the future. But right now I don't think that's possible. What is the biggest concern the public should be aware of regarding deepfakes, or what is the biggest worry that you have being an expert in the technology? Yeah, well, I think you know deepfake algor deepfakes algorithms are quite sophisticated. And as you mentioned, uh, they are creating um, a realistic uh, presence of someone. Um, and, and, and I think the, uh, but I want to say, you know, I, I have two sided messages. The first side of messages is, it is worth something worth a lot of concern, but we are, we don't need to push that panic button yet. Because to make a high quality defect that a lot of people cannot tell the differences is still, not as easy as it sounds. You know, it, somebody can run the algorithm, can create the fakes, but there'll be a lot of artifacts and, uh, um, um, and, and, you know, human eyes can easily identify them. Um, and, and even those high quality fakes, they still have this kind of telltale signs that you can use uh, to, um, uh, to spot them. Like your story, I, I like it a lot by observing, you know, the kind of physique of, uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky is, is different from the real person, right? That's one uh, interesting idea. And we have another uh, similar discovery. You know, there was, um, um, there was a series of uh, videos of supposed to be actor Robert Patterson uh, on TikTok. It, it looks very like him. Um, so what we use is, is a cue. We, we, we use a simple cue to identify those are deep fakes. And it's very similar to the approach you took. You took. Uh, we look at the ear, um, the person's ears, because everybody's ear is unique. It's almost like a fingerprint. And because they only swap the face, um, and that video happens to have, you know, the ears um, shown as a high resolution um, uh, picture. And then we actually get, we get the, the actual subjects, high resolution images, and we compare the features on the ears and we can see they're very different. So I think, you know, this, what I'm saying is the algorithm is powerful, but it still have its Achilles heels. So they're still, you know, uh, they can be spotted. That doesn't say that the algorithm will not develop in the next few years. Um, so, so what I, the other side of my message is we should, we should keep a alert, uh, a high level of alert on the technology. So there are a couple of things. First of all, the technology are actually, you know, developing very, very fast. Uh, we are seeing a lot more deepfake videos than previous, you know, than the preceding years. So um, um, their sheer number is, is, is a problem. Secondly, I think there are new forms. Like, you know, previously we only swap faces, you know, it's relative speaking easy to tell the difference. Now uh, we can have deepfakes where they only change the lead part. Um, it, it's called auto AI driven lip syncing. And in my opinion, that is the most uh, dangerous form of deepfakes because you know it it doesn't show too much of the artifacts, but at the same time, you know it can have the misleading message out very easily. And what is even worse is when this is combined with audio, the the people making deepfakes they will recreate this audio visual experience, right? And um, and and that makes make it more convincing hard to tell the differences. And the third part is um, I, we have yet to see um, a full-blown disinformation campaign based on deepfakes. So, you know, right now, even somebody make a very realistic deepfakes, it is still easy to debunk because we can cross source, you know, validation go to other places and check it up. But what if some dedicated group of people create a deepfake but build the environment surrounding it. Say this person say something, they also show pictures of that person at that location, and they actually they talk about web page, they actually cre recreate a web page, recreate a scientific paper, um, um, all made up, and to make this like a whole web presence. Now we are so, this day, so rely on information we gain on social media and online. And, and that is, you know, if for someone who's dedicated to make that deception, um, uh, uh, believable. I think, you know, combined with the power of deepfakes and all this um, campaign, it could be really hard to debunk. Um, and I think the last factor, which is kind of like a 
root cause for many of the problem are the users. Um, you know, no matter how we do this, uh, we, we develop detection algorithms or the government come up with regulations or the platform companies, you know, be uh, disciplined themselves from, you know, sharing this kind of uh, uh, fake media. Users are really, you know, on one side, uh, the victim, but on the other side, the accomplice of this whole problem. Um, and, and, you know, one, one thing is we're, we're going for the fake stuff because they are more interesting to a certain extent. Truth is usually more boring um, than, than the fake, fake materials. And, and we also spend, we have too short attention span. We were bombarded with all the information sources we have. So every video, I just look at them two seconds and I decide this is an interesting thing. And then I start to share with my friend. Then I, I'm actually becoming part of the problem instead of uh, you know, part of the solution. Right? Um, and the third part is um, awareness. A lot of users, in particular, you know, senior users, um, they are heavily affected by this information, deep, in, in particular deep fakes, they, because they don't have the kind of awareness of you know, images, videos, and audios can be manipulated and fabricated. So you know, if somebody attacking them that is specifically, then they will probably, you know, um, will have a lot of difficulty of tell this apart. So that th those are the things I see as as long term concerns we should have. So I think we we although we are kind of um, um, uh, conservatively optimistic uh, to say defects are currently, you know, under control. Their negative impacts are you know we we, we are not kind of you know um, um, uh, going out of hand. But that doesn't say in the future. So I think you know, that's, that would be my general take on this issue. Thank you so much. You covered everything I was going to ask you. Um, is okay. there anything that you think of that, that we didn't cover that you would like our audience to know that we didn't already touch on? Or have you, you know, anything that we're missing? Uh, I will add two more things. Uh, one is from my research. Uh, so I talk about detection. You know, most of the counter technologies these days are detections, but we are also working on what they call preemptive technologies uh, to help the user, to protect the user better from deepfakes. Now detection, uh, detection methods are quite, uh, quite effective these days actually, but they were like, they are like post-modern. So once something showed up online, it even like a fake uh, uh, media, uh, fake video go online for five minutes, sometimes can gain thousands of views. Um, and, and a particular problem of this kind of things are um, one um, uh, a situation called revenge pornography. So you know, they actually put you know, innocent women's faces into pornographic video and spread them online. And that caused tremendous psychological trauma uh, to the victims. So we need to something that's not just sitting there waiting for the defects to show up and then you know uh, expose them. We need something to protect everyone from becoming defect, uh, victims of defects in the first place. So this is one thing we're trying to do and uh, we want to also bring the awareness to our audience that you know what we're trying to do here is you know whenever we upload our images uh, or you know uh, video audios, to social media, uh, we're trying to develop technologies where we say, you know, protect my face, protect my voice from being abused. Um, and those are technology matters we're taking, like adding a little bit of traces into those data. So that whoever gonna, you know, for the human users, uh, they can still see our faces, they can still hear our voices, no problem. But for, the, for people who want to use this to train their machine learning models, they will run into trouble. Either this will stop their training or, reduce the quality of their training uh, of their models or slow the training process down. Um, or after they create the samples, we can still trace it back to the data we uploaded. So any way to just kind of deter and intimidate them uh, or obstruct them from making deepfakes, right? So that's one point I want to make uh, uh, and not, not many people you know, aware of this. The second point I want to make is um, because my interaction with the users, I think the user awareness is very important. So um, we are, you know, we are su currently supported under an NSF, a National Science Foundation project to develop a program, particularly for senior users, 
to understand the situation of this information, to give them um, 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 some basic knowledge, basic exposure to the possibility and some of the, you know, uh, um, 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 under the hood, a little bit of under the hood understanding of, you know, how this kind of fake media can be made and what kind of impact they will have. So that, you know, with that kind of increased um, awareness, they will, they will be able to handle the situation better in the long run. So I work mostly from the technical side and the user side. And I think, I think that's the, uh, the best combination uh, to, to find a, a better solution to the problem. Yeah, that'll be all. Thank you.